This week, Johnny Robot explores Never Alone, a puzzling co-op platformer that reinterprets Alaskan Indigenous stories. I chat to Pete Hines about just what Bethesda is getting up to at the moment, and we find out a little bit more about Mortal Kombat X, which is looking gloriously brutal. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and we are getting to the pointy end of the year, so please excuse me if I rush through a lot of this stuff this week. There is so much to get through. First up, it's not been a good run for major game releases. Sony's PlayStation 4 exclusive Drive Club is still experiencing issues more than a month after the launch. Racing fans around the world are still unable to log on, and the much-anticipated free version for PS Plus subscribers simply hasn't eventuated. The team at Evolution Studios has come out to offer an olive branch. The game's first two bundles of premium DLC are now offered free to everyone who's bought the original game. That is, five new cars, 22 new tour events, 10 new trophies, and 10 new livery items. By the way, if you did buy a season pass, you will get something else a little later on to make up for Sony giving away something you paid good money for. Assassin's Creed Unity also stumbled out of the gate, with Ubisoft faced with all sorts of annoying issues that affected online co-op, frame rates, and even the ability to progress through the game. The developers have been working diligently on this one since launch, but it could be a while before all the bugs are ironed out. Halo, the Master Chief Collection, is simply a shiny re-release of some games that were already available, so you'd think the online structure would already be there. But you'd think wrong. The latest from Microsoft was also broken when it launched, with gamers unable to log into online multiplayer, which, as anyone will tell you, is kind of a big part of Halo. Even World of Warcraft was not immune to some early launch woes. Immediately after the launch of new expansion set Warlords of Draenor, Blizzard admitted that it was the victim of a distributed denial of service, that is, a DOS attack. As a result, the team reduced the maximum realm populations for World of Warcraft, which meant that in-game latency was reduced, but if you weren't already logged on, it was a long, long wait. In better news, Grand Theft Auto V has finally hit PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and it upset a few people before launch. As if the game itself wasn't already a monster of a download, some 50 gigabytes, there's also a required title update that was designed to smooth over any launch day issues. That's not the end of support for the game. Of course, if you are playing GTA V on the new consoles, developer Rockstar Games wants to know what you think. There's a dedicated support network there if you experience any issues, and it's also a neat place to put some positive feedback for the team while you're at it. So, let's move on to some other things. You can finally race as Link from The Legend of Zelda in Mario Kart 8. The new DLC launched for the Wii U exclusive, bringing with it extra races, extra vehicles, and eight new tracks, including the classic Rainbow Road. A second DLC pack inspired by Animal Crossing is due in early 2015. And speaking of Nintendo, the publisher has also confirmed a third wave of amiibo figurines. If you can hang out until next year, you'll get Lucario, Rosalina and Chico, Bowser, Toon Link, Shake, Ike, Meta Knight, and King Dedede, with a smaller subwave following shortly after containing Shulk, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Mega Man. The third wave of Amiibo figures is set to arrive in Japan on January 22nd, making it to Australia and New Zealand less than a month later. But back to DLC, and Disney has unveiled a stack of new tracks for Fantasia Music Evolved, including tracks by Coldplay, Demi Lovato, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, R.E.M., The Cure, Soundgarden, and Talking Heads, all due out between now and January next year for both Xbox One and Xbox 360. Each song is available separately and comes with three remixes, which you can conduct yourself using Kinect. Some more DLC news, Gearbox Software has just released the first of four new content packs for Borderlands, the pre-sequel, and the new pack means you can play as Handsome Jack himself, or at least his trusty body double, Jack the Doppelganger, using your stunningly good looks to distract your enemies or to cut them down with your witty banter and sharp tongue. So sexy, it hurts. But there's even more Borderlands on the way, as Telltale Games finally gives us a proper look at their take on the franchise, Tales from the Borderlands. Set on Pandora shortly after the events of Borderlands 2, the new story follows two adventurers on their quest for greatness. There's Reese, a Hyperion suit, who desires nothing more in life than to be the next handsome Jack, and then Fiona, a con artist working on her biggest ever swindle. We've been waiting months to find out about this game, only now to find out that the first episode, Zero Sum, is due out before the end of 2014. We got a couple Hyperion warmongers, gentlemen. The bot, Primate! Time to clock in. Hi. Kill them all! Don't shoot my face! You lost the money in a neighborhood of backpack. 
planet nut jobs. In other news, animal activist group PETA has again turned its attention to video games, but this time, unlike angry offerings like Super Tanuki Skin 2D or Super Tofu Boy, it's a much more loving, peaceful protest. PETAcraft runs on a customised Minecraft server where animals are treated with love and respect. We're told that no animals, not even digital ones, can be harmed on the server. Instead, the in-game island is full of lush vegetable and flower gardens, sweeping open landscapes where animals can roam free, a recreation of the PETA headquarters, and even an abandoned, decaying slaughterhouse. And finally this week, even though we feel like we're only just getting over PAX Australia, it's time to start planning ahead. Next year's show has been confirmed for October 30th to November 1st, 2015, and tickets will go on sale in the first week of December. Start saving up. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, got plenty more still to come. Imanga kanga. Kolek to a whole loot, Kanak Silla Blue, King on Eighteen. Kolek to up the Kanak Ship Karova in the Russia, Nuna. Sully Kanak in your neck put Eloni. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Amy Ferdin and I'm with Cook in the Tribal Council and we've um, developed this amazing game with Eline Media called Never Alone. And it's based on traditional Inupiaq stories from Arctic Alaska and it's a beautiful game and I hope you get come and see more about it. I've been enjoying what I've been playing so far. It's basically a wonderful platformer that encompasses stories of your people and it's uh, what I've been playing. It's really, really, really fun. Um, how did you go about sourcing the stories and with the permission it was quiet and things like that? So We actually had to find the elder for the story um, who kind of was the culture bearer for the story and the game is based on the story in Inupiaq it's called it Kanuk Sayuka and it is provides a spine for the game and so we had to literally go find this elder who is the oldest living child the storyteller known for telling it and she gave us permission to use the story and not only use it for video game but modify it so we could bring in new mini adventures into it and so it's an amazing process because she basically told us that you know video games is just a new way of storytelling for people. That is, that's a fantastic approach to it. So you had the stories and you had the people but then you needed the know-how and that's when Alan came in. So Alan would you be able to tell us a little bit about your background in the world of video games? Sure. So I actually started in the video game business in 1992 at Activision when it was less than 12 people and we were kind of rebuilding it in Los Angeles uh, and was there uh, for many years up until about 2000 and then I became chairman of a nonprofit called Games for Change that seeks to harness the power of games for learning, for health, social impact. And we were doing a lot of game-based curriculum in schools. Uh, uh, and w when we got the call from the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, it was the first time we thought we could actually do a game that could compete in the consumer space, but still fire the imagination around new ideas and new themes. When we first went up to Alaska to meet with them, honestly, we tried to talk them out of doing a video game and starting a video game company. I've been in the business for a long time. It's risky. I've seen hundreds if not thousands of companies come and go. It's technology, it's entertainment, and we're adding a cultural element. But much to the credit of the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, when we really studied, we studied the indie game sector, we studied how indigenous cultures were represented in other media, we really believe that there's a hunger for this type of game if we could get the right talent. And together we build a team that we think really can pull this off. You know, at a high level, a lot of people feel like digital media and video games are disconnecting youth and young adults from cultures around the world, from their own culture, their own elders. We believe video games can be an incredibly powerful medium to reconnect youth with their culture, their elders, and with cultures around the world. So playing through, I was feeling some real early classic influences like the Pitfall games and other wonderful things as well. Did you draw upon influence to put the kind of themes and the gameplay mechanics that were there or did you draw upon your own ideas? Yeah, it was interesting. It was everything in this game was done inclusively with the development team and the Alaska Native elders, writers and storytellers. And the team uh, 
came upon the idea of doing a puzzle platform game for a couple reasons. A, we were huge, we actually worked on the early Pitfall games for Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, but more than that, the platform genre is a beloved genre. It, it works for tweens who love Mario to indie gamers who love Limbo. It really crosses generations. And the core themes of interdependence, intergenerational dialogue, resiliency, survival actually map to platform nice. It's also a two-player cooperative game. You play the girl, Nuna, and the fox, and you have to play both characters. So you can play it together at a console, or you can play it single player, switching back and forth, but they're interdependent. Also, platformers tend to have a natural uh, linear spine. So this idea of the endless blizzard, the story that's been passed down for generations, served as a spine for the gameplay, but we leave many other gameplay elements and themes. We also have collectibles. Platformers often have collectibles. And here, instead of collecting, say, gold coins, we actually shot 40 hours of documentary footage, cut them down to 24 one to two minute documentaries that get unlocked as you play the game. And that's a really cool idea. Now, because this is obviously a collaboration effort and we got the game act mechanics, we got what the game wants to be, what do you and your people achieve to get out of this? You know, our first and foremost thing is that, you know, we want to find a way to sustain our mission as a tribal nonprofit entity. And so for us, the video game is going to provide some unrestricted revenue, but more importantly, we want it to be fun and we want it to be an invitation that sparks people's imaginations. And hopefully they'll be curious and want to find out not only more about the Nupiat culture, but other cultures around the world. <laughs> Asin kamna ilin abitual na sigipun. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen from Player Attack. I'm here with Pete Hines from Bethesda, who is the keynote speaker here at PAX Australia. Welcome back. Thanks very much. It's good to be back. How does it feel being invited to be the, the story time speaker for the second only PAX Australia? That was, um, it was pretty cool. It was, um, I was um, touched and honored that they would ask me to do it. Obviously, not being a dev, um, it's a little non-traditional, but um, you know, I just passed my 15-year anniversary at Bethesda, and they thought, look, you've been around a long time, and we think you'd have some interesting story to tell, and hopefully folks enjoyed it. Can't talk about oblivion. <laughs> See, do I even need to explain this to you guys? Like, you all get the joke. Um, yeah, so we decided that horses were really cool and important, and maybe we should um, give people a way to protect them so that they wouldn't die. Seemed like a pretty reasonable idea at the time. You know what, honestly, like Australia is, has always been such a huge supporter of Bethesda and our stuff. Like every time we ship a game here, it always does way better than we expect. Evil Within is doing awesome. Wolfenstein was great. Like you guys really liked it and sort of got what the game was about. Elder Scrolls Online, Dishonored, like uh, you guys are awesome. That's why I like coming down here. Like you really sort of get what we do and the kind of games we make and, and seem to really enjoy it. So I, I love coming down here. You guys, as you just said, you've had a pretty big year in terms of some major releases. I'm so glad to hear everything's going well. Now we're, we're looking to the future. We're looking at Battlecry. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, Battlecry is our first foray into free-to-play. Um, but we wanted to do, being Bethesda, something a little different. Um, we didn't f really feel like uh, sort of a more traditional MOBA was a very good fit for us. So the team at Battlecry Studios has come up with a an action combat uh, online multiplayer game, 16v16, um, and it sort of feels like God of War, but meets Team Fortress, kind of. Like, it's it's very much about fast pace. The controls feel really sort of simple and fluid. If you've played any third-person game, um, you'll be able to pick up Battlecry pretty easily. Um, and it's very easy to pick up, but hard to master. You know, we're very excited to be bringing the beta to Australia and New Zealand, as we, as we just announced. Um, again, I think it speaks to, we think you guys as gamers really get what we do. And I think when it comes to free-to-play, Australia's very, got a very experienced fan base when it comes to free-to-play games, what makes a good one, what parts, um, you, know, you know, should be a certain way. And we felt like it was a great um, way for us to test and play test our game and get a lot of feedback from the community on what they liked and what we should do more of or less of. And yeah, we're very excited to be bringing it here next year. 
Fuck me. B.J. Blaskovich. Caroline, you're alive. If you call shitting in a bag living, three pulverized vertebrae. You? Head trauma, four inches of cast iron shrapnel right in the conch. Still in there. Severed colon, septic shock, shattered pelvis. Memory loss, flashbacks, 14 years in a loony bin. Good to see you, William. Last time I was here, I was talking to you about Wolfenstein. Like, it, it turned out exactly as I hoped, which is, like, we weren't, we weren't, um, uh, trying to kid people like it really was something different and more than just a shooter like the storytelling and the character and all that stuff that that machine games explored and pushed really did come to fruition and when you play through the whole game it felt very fresh um, and different and so yeah it, similarly like it was great to see people like holy cow I didn't see this coming or like it's so much better than I thought and like wait this is really good isn't this really good like um, yeah, I mean it's it's great to see people kind of get that um, you know that we really were trying to do something different and, and um, that they really did enjoy it. Wolfenstein isn't necessarily known for having a particularly solid story behind it oh, you, right. you go in and you shoot stuff yeah. But then the recent one, I've, I've heard people comparing it to cinema, I've heard people comparing it to Quentin Tarantino films, and the thing that I found really interesting was there were a number of women that really, really appreciated the game because it wasn't just a stock standard thing. Yeah. Was this a deliberate move on your part? Um, not deliberate in terms of like, hey, let's set out to create a game where women are going to feel really like empowered or positive about it like i mean no more so than like creating you know key art for battle cry and like it fe um, features a, a very strong female character um that isn't like dainty or slight or ridiculously dressed like we, we don't we're not setting out to like change the industry and how it's just like that just feels like the right way to do it and i think the way that they portrayed it in wolfenstein was very effective i think the way that we're doing it with battle cry is just kind of true to what the game is about and and um, i'm glad that people react positively to it but i think it it always sort of resonates even better when it's not sort of forced or contrived do you know what i mean like if we were trying too hard to be like this is a game about the empowerment of women it would be like oh really like it just it just comes off wrong like it's a game it's a really good game and it happens to portray characters or women or whatever in a way that makes sense and, and just feels right mm -hmm. without trying too hard and like i think that's just a good balance for us that's kind of the way we want it to to be Quick recap, how did we get to Mortal Kombat X in, in terms of storyline? Ah, that's a great question. We do, obviously, one of the things that Mortal Kombat's known for is the deep history and story that we have with our characters. I mean, this is a franchise that's 20 years old at this point, so there's really deep history with all of our characters. And, you know, if you saw with La the last Mortal Kombat, it was kind of a retelling of MK1, 2, and 3, and kind of a re-envisioning of those. And uh, we do kind of pick up where that game left off, Although we're set a little bit further in the future, one of the characters that we've announced is actually Cassie Cage. She's the daughter of Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade, so that should give players an idea of where we've gone with the storyline. Unfortunately, beyond that, we haven't revealed many details yet. There will be a lot of cool information coming soon, but suffice it to say, there's a really great deep story to this game as well. Now, we've, we've touched on characters, so we have, to, we have to talk about the characters. Obviously, Cassie is fighting, and she's got a, a mix of styles. There are a couple of old favorites who are, who are back again. Who are we going to meet this time around in Mortal Kombat X? Well, there's obviously always going to be Scorpion and Sub-Zero. I mean, you pretty much can't make a Mortal Kombat game without them. Those are our two iconic classic characters. So you'll see them in this game for sure. Uh, Cassie Cage, we just mentioned. Um, there's a new character called Kotal Khan. He's from Outworld. It's about all I can say about that right now. 
Uh, we also have Farrah Tor. She's she and he, he and she. This very unique character for us. It's actually two characters in one. You've got this big hulking brute, and he's got this insane little lady that rides on his back and like helps determine his actions in, in combat. Um, in addition, we've also got Devora, who's this new human-insect hybrid. She's got all these cool abilities and powers based around being able to summon these insect swarms and things. So it's a very interesting cast of characters. Um, in addition, we actually just announced Quan Chi is in the game as well. So a longtime fan favorite. We announced last night he's actually playable here at the EB Games Expo for the first time. Fool. At your worst, sorcerer. You shall see my worst fight. And he was the one that I was playing at. And with the new variation system, that meant that I was able to do some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So with Mortal Kombat X, every character has three different variations. So every character is going to have a set of moves that are shared amongst the three. But then depending on which variation you choose, you have unique specials and abilities that are, that are, are exclusive to that variation. So it allows you to strategize and play the game in a little bit different ways depending on how you want to play. So Quan Chi, let's just use him as an example since he's our new character. Um, in one mode, he actually uses his teleporting ability, his ability to summon portals to kind of control the space around him. So you can kind of, uh, you know, your opponent may be a few steps back, but they're not safe because he can open up portals and, and attack his opponent that way. Uh, there's also a variant where he can summon a minion to help him out. It's this big bat creature. So really, this is a really aggressive version of Quan Chi because not only is Quan Chi fighting, but this, this minion, this bat, is helping him out in the fight as well. And then finally, there's a more, almost a defensive version of the character where he can use his magical abilities, his runes and spells to give himself a little bit better offense or a little bit better defense, you know, kind of buff his abilities and attacks and things of this nature. So depending on which variant you choose, plays very differently. So you've been watching people playing the game here at the Warner Brothers booth. What sort of, have you noticed any particular patterns with the Australian gamers in a bit of Mortal Kombat? They're extremely excited. They're extremely <laughs> enthused. I'm happy to see a lot of people choosing Sub-Zero. It's my favorite character. <laughs> um, no, everybody seems to be loving the game so far. I haven't heard a, a negative report yet at all. And, you know, it seems like um, they really enjoy the gameplay. They, everybody's comments that it's really fast, it's really fluid. And uh, yeah, we think we've got a good one on our hands. <laughs> the Mortal Kombat franchise had a little bit of a rocky history here in Australia. We're not going to go into too much detail, but uh, thank goodness that we now do actually have an adults only rating, which means that this one should be able to come through. Yeah, I mean, we hope so too. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in how the ratings process goes, unfortunately, but uh, it's always disheartening to us to spend so much time on a game and then find out that it's not available somewhere. So fingers crossed, um, we're going to put out the best game we can and hopefully you guys will be able to enjoy it soon. And that's about it for this edition of Flayer Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, I catch up with ID at Xbox boss Chris Charla to chat about some of the amazing indie games coming out on Xbox. Never Alone is actually one of them, and it's out now. While Johnny Robot shares his thoughts on Battlecry, the upcoming free-to-play team-based action game from Bethesda. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com, we're on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter, and if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.